All right, it's now recording. So, where was I? So, with patient assessment, um, yeah, I want to see you talking to your patients. Don't be, uh, don't be a a robot. Okay. Now, patient assessment can be kind of overwhelming in that there's a lot of stuff to remember. But what I do is I help you learn it in a systematic way. Now, the other thing before I get to uh, my sayings, the other thing is this patient assessment lecture, the, the way I do it, I, I came up with it when I was working in a, in a mountain community. I was teaching an EMT class up there. And one of the students comes up to me one day and says, Lou, I'm having a hard time understanding patient assessment. Can you walk me through it? Because I should teach it differently. And I thought, hmm, okay. And then the light bulb came on over my head, and that town was known for their apples and apple pies. So I thought, hmm, okay. Well, let, let's, work at, let's work at it this way. Let's break it down in something easy and work from there. And so I told them, let's eat a pie. We'll each eat a pie. And we'll break it down that way. Now, that an analogy about eating a pie, and yes, when we do patient assessment in person, um, we... I buy you guys donuts, and if you guys, you know, usually the class will bring in like chocolate or milk or something like that. The last class, my last class, actually did bring uh, chocolate. We had hot chocolate and uh, and and donuts. And somebody found the abuelita chocolate, in the powder, not the big uh, uh, discs, but in the powder. Oh, she got an A for the day. But anyway. So using that analogy, can you eat a pie in one sitting? No. No, not it's, really. It's yes. difficult, <laughs> but you cut it you cut it up. No, you have a whole pie. You're not breaking down or anything. Can you eat that pie whole? Yes. No. How do you eat that pie? No. In bites. You slice it. Yeah, you slice it up and then you eat it bite by bite. So think about this analogy. How do you eat an elephant? We eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? Like you the first week well, you start with the leg and then I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, close enough. Uh, you eat it one bite at a time. Okay. How about the journey of a thousand miles? Sorry, this step. Yep, starts with the first step. So things are doable. You just got to find the way to do it. And that's what patient assessment is. If you take that pie and you break it down, and uh, now it's four slices. Can you eat four slices of pie? Yeah. Makes it a lot easier than, than eating a whole pie, right? Yeah. yeah. So you break it down into slices. And those slices, we'll give them names. And we'll call those scene size up, primary assessment, secondary assessment, and reassessment. Okay. So. Hey, quick question, Lou. Um, we're not going to go over the chapter twelve of the scene size up. Well, that's what what we're doing today. You're saying patient assessment, right? Yeah. <laughs> but include scene size up. Oh, okay. Just bear with me. Just bear with me. So. I'll, I'll share the PowerPoint after the lecture because okay? okay. I'll have a PowerPoint. Okay. Oh. 
Okay. So here's the way patient assessment looks. When you look at it, look at all those flow charts. Wait, it gets better even more. Is that, do you memorize that? No. It's difficult, right? When you, when you first picture it. So, all right. So I blank out the screen a lot because uh, I'm going to do some talking. Okay. So going back to Ms. Sequoia's question. The scene size up. That's the very first thing that, that we do in the patient assessment. Now, again, if you compare it to the outline that I gave you, you'll see you'll you'll be able to follow along as well. You need the 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 outline I gave you, and then the um, your your skills manual for patient assessment. Okay, now. The very first thing we do is scene size up. Here's how you need to think about scene size up. Is it safe for you to get out of your vehicle? Number one. And number two, is it safe to approach your patient? So things that you have to assess. Is it safe for you to get out of your vehicle? Are there any dogs? Is there uh, smoke? Are there fumes? Are there uh, power lines? Is there a dude with a gun coming at you? So is the scene safe for you to get out of your vehicle? If you determine yes, now as you go and start approaching the patient, is it safe for you to approach that patient? Do they have any weapons? Are there pit bulls right next to them? Are they um, holding a gun? Are they, you know, what, what's the case? Is it safe for you to approach your patient? All right. So the purpose of the scene size up is to determine whether it's safe for you to uh, get out of your vehicle, number one. And number two, is it safe to approach the patient? Once you make that, what was that? It doesn't have nothing to do with how many patients you have to treat at the same time. We're not talking about that yet. Oh, sorry. Right now, the very the, the main reason we do the Ursine size up is to make sure it's safe for us to get our vehicle and then is it safe to approach the patient. Now, the other components of the scene size up, so we, we've determined that's there, okay? The other components of the scene size up, we're gonna utilize the acronym PENMAN, okay? P-E-N-M-A-N. And the reason we do Penman is it helps keep the, the scene size up organized. Now, Penman is actually taught in BTLS, Basic Trauma Life Support. And I remember learning that and I kind of like, okay, but I actually liked it. And so I started using it in my in my classes. If you look at your skills sheet, your skills packet, um, Penman is there. You don't recognize it, but after this, you'll be able to pick it out. You'll be able to recognize it. So looking at looking at the PowerPoint real quick. Sorry, I gotta get there. All right. So there's Penman. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I should take my, <laughs> my cough syrup. So Penman stands for PPE, environment, number of patients, mechanism of injury or nature of illness, 
additional resources, and finally need for extrication slash C spine. That's Penman. It's what you're looking for when you're determining whether your scene is safe. So PPE and environment. PPE is your, your personal protective equipment, BSI. Environment is your scene safety. Pretty simple, right? First words are your mouth should always be BSI scene safety. So guess what? It's the first two things. Now, as far as the number of patients go, how many do you have? If you have too many for you to handle, then maybe you need to get additional help. Or is it the one patient? Because if you have more than what you can handle, then maybe you need to get additional resources, and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, next is your mechanism of injury and nature of illness. Your mechanism of injury is the forces that caused an injury to your patient. And your nature of illness is what, what medical thing is going on with your patient. Are they sick with the flu? Do they have coronavirus? Um, you know, what's going on with your patient? And then the additional resources. What other resources are you going to need? Might you need more ambulances? Might you need a uh, fire engine, uh, uh, a quint, a big truck? Um, are you going to need uh, EPE, uh, El Paso Electric? Are you going to need water department? Are you going to need vector control? Uh, for example, somebody's getting attacked by bugs. Maybe you need vector control or animal control or just a, a, sh a bunch of raid. Um, I, I went on a call, actually it was a medical aid, and, and as we were finishing up, the, the patient's uh, neighbor comes over to us and says, hey, I got this bee problem there, they're really attacking us. And so we ended up, uh, we called vec vector control also, but uh, we ended up going in there. Uh, they, they, bees don't like yellow, so they were attacking us, and uh, uh, the other captain, he showed me his jacket, he had stingers on his on his jacket and the bees being very upset but uh we helped get rid of the bees we were there quite a while uh so what other resources do you need do you need the coroner's office do, do you need pd to go and lastly this is a two, a two step thing you need for extrication and then slash c-spine does the patient need to be extricated from where they're at or we got to think about spinal precautions because the patient might need uh, some additional equipment, some additional care. But we'll talk about the importance of it in just a mo in just a little while. Okay. So, pen man, PPE, environment, number of patients, mechanism, injury, nature of illness, additional resources, and need for extrication slash C spine. Okay. That's your scene size up. Now, this is not sexist. This is inference. You infer something. So remember Penman, okay? 
PP environment, number of patients, mechanism, injury, and natural wellness, additional resources, and need for education slash C spine. All right. So you're that that lone EMT, that little nerdy EMT in the back. The glasses, the pink stethoscope. Is this scene safe for you to enter? No. Okay. I heard a window. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's an unpredictable scene, but yes, whatever the image is showing, I mean, it would be safe as of right now. I don't, but I don't know what's happening so, so, I, didn't, I didn't see who said no. There's plenty of space to work from, too. Okay. But when we're talking about scene safety, we're talking about your not necessarily the your work area your workstation but are there dangers that can harm you yeah what were you saying rosie the people sitting down okay so are you saying this safe yeah. this scene is safe or not safe i mean it can and it can't be right now the way you look at it is this scene safe yes i would say no why do you say no? Because as you mentioned in the beginning, it's going to, you, you said, um, we're that nerdy EMT walking in. And it seems like we're walking in on a whole bunch of guys just having a good time. And usually with guys, usually with guys together, they have a lot of confidence and they have a lot of, uh, okay. I guess you can say that they feel like they, they can make fun of other people. So I guess it wouldn't be safe for you to walk into someone like that in a situation like that. Okay, so I got two no's and, and everybody else is saying yes. Yeah, now, mind you, pretty safe. I would say no. Now, mind you, you're Can her. You <laughs> sure. I'll go for like it is she is female and it looks like they're at a bar. Okay, so yeah, you're not you, you're her. So, again, not being sexist, but she doesn't look very tough. Now, the the mood is, <laughs> excuse me, the mood's a little different because Rosie said it's a bar, and it looks like a bar, right? Yeah. Doesn't look like a sandwich shop. Yeah. But there's too much light coming in. Usually, bars are dark. You don't have that much lighting coming in. Am I correct? Yes. I don't frequent bars, so I can tell you for sure. But the bars I have seen back in my youth, from back in my youth. But I, I want you guys to know something. What about the Grizzly Adams looking dude? He looks a little intimidating. Like his face looks like he's thinking something. What's his attitude? He's probably intoxicated. He doesn't care. No, we can't assume doesn't intoxication. Care, we can't no. assume just because they're in a the bar. We can't assume. <coughs> we can't assume that that he's intoxicated. Unless we have a reason to, to infer that he might be intoxicated, we can't assume that he is. He looks intimidating. Yep. Does he look like I don't give a shit? Yeah. Like he's there for a good yeah. job. Or he looks like um he like he kinda ended the fight or like knocked him out or something. I don't know. Okay. And then the beach boy looking dude also doesn't give a shit. And then the guy in the red shirt with his back to us. 
I can tell you, and Rosie can too, that people are nosy. Yes. Okay. In, all you have to do is just drive by an accident. How many looky loos do you have? A lot of people always want to look. Yeah. And check this out. I had a call one time. It was in the, at the Wild Animal Park in San Diego. And we get a call for a guy that had, I think, a seizure or something. And so we show up, and this elderly gentleman comes by, and he stands like three feet away from the patient. And I'm just looking at the camera for you guys. You guys are the dude, and he's just kind of looking at him. And, and at first I'm thinking that's like the guy's dad or father-in-law or something, right? And so I go up to the guy and I ask him, sir, can I help you? Oh, no, thank you. I'm just looking. <laughs> what? He floored me. He doesn't know what's going on, but he gets literally right next to the dude and starts looking him up and down. Just want to know what was going on. Oh, I got him out of there so quick. I know in all my years that people are nosy. And you guys have kind of figured that out too. People are nosy. Do these guys look nosy? Yeah. Yeah. They do look nosy? To me, if they're nosy, they'd be around the dude, not sitting up on their chair. No, they don't look nosy. They're there at the location. They're not nosy. They're just turned around. To me, and again, I'm just inferring here, but to me, if I see that, I'd be worried as to why they don't give a shit. Because I think some people would be around the dude like, hey, dude, what's going on? You know, did he have a seizure? Did he have a medical condition that caused him to collapse? So why aren't they down there? So I can see maybe a little nosy, but for the most part, I'm worried about the way they look. Now, here's the other thing that worries me. What? Well, that it's a bar that you're her and you're not you. But what else do you see in that picture that may make you kind of be a little hesitant getting too close without checking it out first? Well, they look careless, so they have to be behind the reason why the gentleman's on the floor. That's a very good possibility. What else do you see in that picture? No clue. Where is his hand? Is he maybe reaching for a weapon? Or is he getting it ready so when somebody comes up to him, he could cold cock him as payback? Or it could be a knife. It could be a knife? Thinking, hey, one of these guys might come over and check me out, so I'm going to stab him for trying to beat me up but in reality aren't they supposed to stage and wait for pd to show up before you go in if it's in a bar like that reality yeah but there might be instances where that doesn't happen I'm just saying that you have to look at the scene to make sure that you're safe. Because the one thing I forgot to tell you guys way back in chapter two is you are the most important thing. Yes. We want to do what we can for our patients. And yes, I, I firmly believe and maybe it doesn't make me sound humble, but I believe that what we do is a very honorable thing. However, there are times where we have to be selfish, and that is taking care of ourselves. Now, I know there's a lot of my colleagues that are going out to New York to help out, 
But did you hear what New York is doing to them? No. No. That if you if you've worked out there more than two weeks, then you're going to have to pay state income tax. <laughs> to New York. Regardless, you're you're kind of yep. If you went to work, if you if you've gotten paid to go work out in New York, the state is going to charge you income tax. That's dumb. For That's those crazy. two weeks. Yeah. So so much for uh thank you for coming over and helping out. I know. We're still gonna I, tax you though. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna tax you. Wow. So tell me it's not messed up. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Very. That's messed up. Yep. I think it is. So anyway, so you're the most important thing. Your safety. Don't we all have somebody to go home to in a way? I mean, you might not have a significant other, and I'm not trying to belittle that, but Maybe you have parents. So we all have someone to go back to in one way or another. The next most important person is your partner. After your partner, then comes the patient and then come the bystanders. So that's the level of importance. You, your partner, the patient, finally bystanders. So I would be very leery about this scene. So is it, is it a secure scene? In my opinion, no. Can you what make would it? You yeah. Do in that situation? What was that? What would you do in that situation? Back out and call PD and wait for them to get there. Regardless, the patient looks unresponsive? Yep. Not only that, but she's by herself. Usually the EMTs are with two people. Exactly. And like the other guy's not there, so why would you enter the scene if you're by yourself? Exactly. Now the other thing is, even what? <coughs> excuse me. Even once your partner gets there, I would be leery to turn my back to those guys. I can tell you from having transported gunshot victims that you'll get a police escort to the hospital because they might try to go back and finish the job. In Mexico, it's happened. In infamous Culiacán, Sinaloa, Mexico, uh, they shot this dude up. Uh, he didn't die. So Cruz Roja, I think it was Cruz Roja, went to pick up the guy. They took him to the hospital. While they were there, they came back, they finished the job, but unfortunately they also killed the female paramedic that was tending to that patient. Is it worth it? No. Nope. no Your no. life is not worth it. Although it's something that we, we acknowledge that we, we go into uh, with our eyes wide open. That's what I just realized. I was like, sort of off topic, of but it's like, as an EMT and all that stuff, we don't have like protection. What well, the only protection we do have is the police, right? Correct. Now, some agencies are starting to get um, uh, vests, bulletproof vests, or body armor, but it um, all depends on the agency. Now, some people, and if you look around, you'll find EMS ballistic vests. Um, and, and they're a little bit cheaper. Some of them have discount programs or whatever else, but they're starting to do that. So uh -huh. some agencies will provide it to you, like mine, Sierra Blanca doesn't. But I know one of the guys I work with, he has his own. And remember, in the state of Texas, if you work for a volunteer agency as a firefighter or ZMS, um, if they... If your agency will allow you to, they have to have protocols in place. You can carry a concealed weapon. So, you know, it's kind of interesting that when you work in a town where the sheriff has a, a price tag on his head, 
I think it's a million dollar bounty that he has put out against him. Wow. Huh? So for like mass shootings and all that, do they get police escorts to the hospital as well? Uh, it, it would depend. Um, the last time I ran a shooting was in December of 2014. And uh, it was a big man manhunt. There was four individuals that were wanted. Um, and then they ended up uh, getting a shootout with police. So we did get a police escort to the landing zone. And then the helicopter flew them out to UMC. So um, I, I think it depends on the situation. They might free up a, an officer to, to, to go over there. But um, a lot of times they're still waiting for resources to get there. So if you're thinking something big like Las Vegas, no, they, they got, I think, too much going on. Because how many people were injured? 500 or 500? So. It was pretty, pretty interesting going to Vegas about a year later and, and kind of seeing the area. And I even uh, gambled at Mandalay Bay. And just kind of thinking about what happened at that hotel. And then um, driving around and seeing the area. They still had it closed off. It's been a while. I was there last April. Yeah, I was in Vegas last April. Um, and they still had it closed down. So. All right. Um, give me my arrow. Okay. Uh, what about this scene? I don't think I would want her. No. 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 It's propane. What's the thing about propane? Anybody know? They explode. It what? They explode. Okay, it can go ka frickin' boom. What else? You're too close to the scene. Yeah. What else? Oxygen gas. Yes, yeah, propane. So propane gas. Propane is heavier than air. What does that mean for us? It talks to your lungs. It what? It's bad for your lungs. Oh yeah, but what else? Heavier than air means it's going to settle low to the ground. And so as it spills more and more, then it's going to be spreading over the ground. And it's looking for an ignition source. And that gas is under high pressure. And I can tell you, having fought vegetation fires, that when they get heated up, they need to vent off. And when it's venting off, it sounds just like a jet engine getting ready to take off. And then when it explodes, I swear I almost shit my pants. And uh, uh, one of the, my fellow captains, he was driving down and he drove right next to the tank. Or, and he stopped next to the tank that was venting. And he quickly realized it wasn't a good place to be stopped at. So he started hauling ass away from there. And a few minutes later, that tank blew. I remember that. Yeah, it scared the living daylights out of me. So how's that situation? You got to worry about yourself, your partner, your, uh, the public. Um, chemicals can be very, very dangerous. And this one, again, it's the danger of explosion. Uh, what he's doing is using binoculars. He's looking at the containers. He's looking for the, the UN placards to help identify the substance. So that way he knows safe evacuation distance and what he can do and, and stuff like that. So... Okay. All right. 
How about this one? Do we get paid to deal with these guys? No. The guy in the hat? No. The two with the guns on their side do. And I'd rather hang back and deal with a gunshot victim because those are funner to treat than the psych patient. You got better stories. Oh, yeah, this dude got shot. They get paid the big bucks to carry a gun and deal with this kind of stuff. Now, the other thing, though, is, and now I'm just speaking scientifically. Don't want anybody to get mad at me. But humans are considered what? Dangerous. Idiots. What else? <laughs> Oh, they're saying the planet is making a comeback now that people aren't out there. But go ahead. Uh. Humans are considered what? Not Homo sapiens, although we are. Impulsive. Huh? Impulsive. Okay, okay impulsive. How about, are we classified as animals? Yeah. Yeah, because we yeah. fight. Yeah. And what do cornered animals do when, or what do animals do when they're cornered? Attack. They uh, attack. Or they fight back, access. right? So, do you think this guy's going to have reason to fight back? Yeah. 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 And look at her. Doesn't she look like she's ready to throw down? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You gangster. I know. <laughs> you know, they've had to escalate it for a reason. I don't think they should have, but then again, I don't know what, what was the call for, but she's kind of making it worse because both of them are there. Usually you want to keep one out of sight to diffuse the situation. But for both of them to be there, something's happened. So, what's the other thing the animal might do? Try to flee. Exactly. Yeah. Remember, yeah. fight or flight? So, he might try to run away. But, you see this scene, you're standing back. Let them take care of it. And once they, they uh, have the gentleman in custody, then it's safe. Now, have I gotten in the middle of things in the past? Yeah. yeah. Actually, recently, too. Had a combative guy. He was already... I uh, had a handcuffs on and stuff, but he was fighting. And so um, they were going to get the hog ties, I think. And... Um, I have a question. Definitely... Yes. Why are you called to the scene when he doesn't look like he... Well, maybe he's on something, but who knows, though. But, like, he looks perfectly healthy. Yeah, but his behavior might have been irrational. And so that's what the call came down. But they sent PD as well to, to assist. Oh. And they get there, or you get there, and he becomes combative. Hey, guys, you guys take it away. We'll be right over here. Wait till you put a spit mask on them. They get real aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, to hold them down. Yeah, so no, you can get called out to this initially, and it just, it turns into this. So there's a rationale for it. Have you dealt with um, psych patients? Oh, yeah. Yep. And drunks i remember this one gal um we get called out she wasn't she was drunk and i forget what else and, and the cops were there or maybe the cops called us out for her and one trick that i've always used that it always worked up to that day was when they're being belligerent i try to uh, assess them and everything and I give them the option. I tell them, you could either go with them, the cops, or you can go with me. 
up until that day, like I said, they'd always chosen me. They don't want to deal with the cops. They don't want to get arrested. They don't want to go through that. Well, she chose the cops. She was regretting it as we were leaving. But uh, the thing with her was she was drunk. And uh, one of my firefighters, he just wasn't connecting with her. So I started talking to her. And she connected with me. And she had a tat over her heart. And I asked her what that was about. And she told me that that was the day. And maybe it was like a year ago. Uh, that was the day that she went to cardiac arrest. So, um, yeah, so I've dealt with drunks with the cops. Uh, also, um, I've responded out to the jails to check on patients. I do that in Sierra Blanca. Um, when I worked uh, for the tribal fire department, we used to get called out, out to tribal PD headquarters to evaluate uh, people that had arrested. They're complaining of something. We go in and we check them out. A lot of times it's what we call, or I call it, and it makes good sense, it's called incarceritis, where they don't want to go to jail, so they start faking something. Oh, my, my chest hurts. Oh, I can't breathe. Yes, yeah, you, yeah, you're being diagnosed with a case of incarceritis. Everything else is fine. It's just, what was that? The favorite ones from the halfway house. Oh, yeah. In Horizon? Yeah. As a female, never get out there. Yeah, I forget what they nickname it, but um, I, th I think in a way it's good that you're you're not riding out with life. But yeah, uh, females are not encouraged to go in there and talk to the male patients because a lot of them are, are sexual offenders. And they'll start calling just to get out of there to be seen by females. And believe me, they talk, so. Yeah. Not recommended. All right, so you're seeing. Now your mechanism of injury, trauma. What do you think happened to this guy? He fell off the ladder. Okay, that's a possibility. What else? There's a stone next to him, so maybe he... He tripped. Okay, he tripped and did what? Brain his ankle. Sprained his ankle, maybe he cut ankle. himself with a saw. Or he fell off the truck. He f might have fallen off the truck. So you got I the mean, arrow, you're seeing his ankle, the saw, um, although I forgot to mark the tail bed. What was that? Nothing. No, sir. No, the, the saw on the floor and the electrical cord. Yeah. Yep. So you got to look to see what might have caused the injury. He's holding his ankle, so you know, any of those are possibilities. Oh, sorry. Okay. So. Thinking about mechanism. And we'll get more into this when we deal with trauma. But before I go on, so Miss Sequoia, you see how I'm kind of uh, how I'm covering the scene size up? Yeah. Part of that lecture? Yeah. All right. You happy then? Yep. I didn't disappoint you? No. Okay. I don't want to disappoint you, so I'm just making sure. <laughs> so when we're thinking about mechanism, we got to think about what caused the injury, correct? Yeah. All right. So we have, let me pick a name. Yeah, this today is, um, Frankie, are you there? No, Frankie? Frankie? I was here earlier. Frankie. 
see you're logged on. There's a problem with their mic. Okay. I see there's a problem with my mic. Okay. Well, I'll still use Mr. Frankie as the example. Just get a whiteboard or a paper and write out your answer. Yeah, you're at least turn on your camera so we can see you. Gotta find my pen so I can start marking. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So I had to leave and come back. All right. All right, so Frankie is my, uh, my example. <clears throat> so Frankie's driving along in his, what's your favorite car, Frankie? Uh, I guess mine, the one I have right now. Okay, what do you have? A Firebird. All right, nice car. I remember those cars. They don't make them anymore, unfortunately. My mom actually still has a 1999 Firebird, I think. Kind I want to like get rid of it. The way? I kind of want to get rid of it. Kind of tired of it. Why, too much money to upkeep it? Yeah, pretty much. For the upkeep, yeah. Yeah, because you don't find parts anymore for it, right? Or very limited? Yeah, it's rare. It's a conspiracy, I tell you. <laughs> so, Frankie, you're in your Firebird, so this might make you happy. Maybe not, okay. I don't know. So <laughs> you're driving along. And out of nowhere, this damn tree jumps out in front of you. You're minding your own business. This damn tree decides to jump out in front of you. <laughs> so after a couple bad words come out of your mouth, you go straight into that tree. Okay. So that's a collision because we'll say Frankie was doing 75. He's on our, we'll say it's freeway speed. And now he, he crashed into that tree. And now he's doing zero miles an hour, right? Or at least his car is, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. So that's the first impact that, that occurs in this trauma. Now, the car was doing 75, now he's at zero. If his car was doing 75, how much was Frank, Frankie himself doing? <clears throat> 75. All right. So Frankie himself was doing 75. But because he was a good driver, he was wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> he didn't go all the way forward. So he went from 75 to zero. Right? So that's the second impact. Which is, the first impact is an object against another object. The second impact is your body against the object. Now, we know that Frankie was doing 75, came to a complete stop. But what else is also going 75? His heartbeat. Well, yeah, but come back a little bit. Oh. Huh? The impact? 
His organs. His organs, right? Remember, you guys read this? I don't know if it's in there, but so his organs. So his body's going 75, they come to a complete stop. Well, his organs were also doing 75. And they're going and all of a sudden complete stop and his organs keep going and go, ah, shit. You know, did you watch Tommy Boy? Where that bug smashes into a windshield and David Spade is all out of it. He's stoned or something. And he's yeah. talking about how that bug was just kind of minding his own business and slow motion. And it's like, here comes the car. Ah, right. Remember that? <laughs> Never saw it, but there's a good picture in my head now. Yep. Gotta watch it. So, anyway, so that's what his organs were doing. They're minding their business, and all of a sudden, they're being thrust forward. Ah, <clears throat> a little visual there for you guys. I don't know if you saw me. Um, and so those organs shifted. And that's the third collision. Internal organs against your body. Here's the bad thing about that. It's some of them are held by ligaments. Some of them are blood vessels. So you go really hard. What you could do is you could shear off blood vessels. For example, the aorta. How long do you, get, you think you have to live? Less than 10 minutes. Oh, a lot less than 10 minutes. Hopefully the answer when you're calling to say goodbye, because you only have about two, three minutes. So another thing that happens. Your head. Or your head, yeah, your brain. But in your chest, let's say that uh, the individual involved in the accident wear, wasn't wearing a seatbelt. So they're driving along, and all of a sudden, boom, right? Chest into the steering wheel. Crushes it. Okay, so you have rib injuries, but what else? Heart, internal bleeding. Keep going. Your spine, maybe? No, nope. I'm trying to reach a bag over here. The air inside your lungs. Uh huh. Keep going. It gets pushed out by the impact. No. Nope. Well, it does. How? You could collapse a lung. How? The force. The pressure. Okay. Give me a visual. A pulmonary contusion? Nope. It's like a water balloon hitting someone's face after you threw it. Did you guys never have paper bags? Yeah. Paper bag? When you blow into it, it pops. What was that? When you blow into it, it pops. Well, how does it pop? The force of With the force. <laughs> pop. All right? Yep. Yeah, you took that bag in your hand. You see my bag? I can't even see me. Isn't that a hemothorax? It, it will... It will if there's blood, but no, the injury I'm referring to is called the paper bag injury. So it's like taking a paper bag or even a plastic bag and you put air in it, it is the lung full of air, and you compress it, just like popping that bag, pop, right? Are you guys following? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I used yeah. to do it for fun. <laughs> yeah, me too. Let me get rid of my background so you see a little better. So, 
So I'm taking that bag. And here's my chest wall. Here's the long. And all of a sudden. So what happens maybe up in here? Pop. Right? So it's going to create a new pneumothorax. But that kind of injury on the lung itself is called a paper bag injury. Because you took that paper bag with air and you popped it. You put pressure on it to pop it. Or to scare the shit out of your little brother or sister. So. All right, so this is what we're talking about. So the three types of collisions, we have the auto into the object, the body into the car or the object, and then finally the internal organs into the body. So, so here we have the Mercedes, of course, they never follow the speed limit. Lexuses are, are bad too and BMWs. Just observations that I've made over the years. And there's that damn tree jumping out in front of you for no apparent reason. So you're going, you're going. Use your body against the auto or the object. And then you have, your, you have your internal organs crashing. Okay. So something with mechanism of injury, that's where you're going to have to think what caused my injury and also what other injuries might I have. All right. Questions on that? No, sorry. No. So in that situation, you will use the OPQRST? For what? For the mechanism of injury? like the No. Other? No. And I'll, and I'll explain why later. Okay. But no, we wouldn't we'll use the OPQRST. Now, as far as the nature of illness, this is when somebody appears to be sick. We try to find out what's going on. Now, with your clues there on the screen, what do you think is going on with them? Attention. Do what? Cool. Her face, she looks like she's just doing it for attention. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> don't you get those calls, Lou? Like, the ones that fake it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. She's just looking like she wants her husband to hurry up to get to bed. <laughs> She's pissed off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, the one thing I learned in psychology was when you are given a picture, what, what you think about what you see is what you're actually experiencing yourself. So I'm having fun listening to these answers. Aww. Sequoia, watch what you say, Sequoia. Watch what you say. Interesting. Inter I, I learned something about you guys today. She's thinking it's five o'clock somewhere. 
And so well, there's her glass right there. Look at her her uh, her whiskey glass. <laughs> exactly, it's empty. Uh huh. I think she's regretting too. She has to get up and has to go pour another one. Could be. Or the husband won't bring it to her. <laughs> and in, the, in these in these times, it's like I think I got the COVID, baby. I got the Rona. You got to take care of me. What is that thing on the bed? Like that white, whatever. Is it those blankets that were mud? It's interesting to hear the younger generation talk about that and try to figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> they don't yeah. Make those it, no more? Huh? They don't make those no more? No. Uh -huh. Aww. Ask, ask your classmates. Do they know what you that is for? I have a make kitty blanket. It's an electric blanket. I have like two of them. Oh, that's an electric blanket. I remember they had horrible wires through the blankets. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. I have one. I use it in the winter and I get like tangled up in the wires. <laughs> it means you need to get a new one. I like my like my old one. He likes the wires. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys are seeing <laughs> that she is sick in however way she is. Yes, the electric blanket, so she might have chills. Yeah, the tissue paper there. Yeah, that, that oh. glass, that could be her. Oh, it's brown because of what's on the other side. Um, yeah, it's touching her stomach. Mm -hmm. So clues to let us know that she might be sick. <clears throat> okay. So the first piece of the pie is called what? What did we name it? Scene size up. Scene size up. And why did we do the scene size up? To save to get off the Safety. ambulance and safe to approach the patient. All right. Is it safe for you to get off your vehicle? Is it safe for you to approach the patient? And what are we looking for in our scene size up? Mechanism of injuries. Organize it. Man part. What was that? Oh, nothing. Go ahead. No, use it. You first. I lost it. If this is the man part of the pen thing. Yeah, pen man. Pen man. Yes. So you could use pen man. What does pen man stand for? PPE, environment. environment. Man, number of patients, number of mechanism of injury, additional resources, need of extrication. Additional resources. And need of extrication. Need for extrication slash. Spinal precaution. Spinal precaution. So remember that. PP environment, number of patients, mechanism of injury, nature of illness, additional resources, and need for extrication slash C spine. So just think of that as you're approaching your patient. Okay. Um, now the next part. So actually, before I get to that. So how was that first slice of pie? Was it good? Yes. Sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a little attitude with that, sure. No. You're not completely satisfied with the um, piece that you got. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> she knows who controls her grade, so. Mm. All right. So the next slice of pie, we're going to name it primary assessment. Now, it's also called the initial assessment. But right now, it went back to primary assessment. Okay. Now, the purpose of the primary assessment is to look for and control anything life threatening. Yeah, to look for and control anything life threatening. There's one problem with that. Let me just mind down there. That deals primarily from an area from here, from the top of my nose, down to about, where did I go? I don't know if you can see. I think your background is helping. Yeah. To about right here, my mid chest. Okay. My primary assessment primarily deals with that. Can I see? So, looking for and controlling anything life-threatening because the patient could die as a result. Now, when you're doing the primary assessment, there is a process. And that process is, think about the scene size up, remember how you had to get out of your vehicle and then approach your patient? Yeah. So think about approaching the patient. Um, and that's the way you need to, to approach this. Now, as far as as how to really keep it organized in your head, think about this. Three, three, one. The numbers. First thing is we have the first three, the second three, and then a one. If you look at your skills packet, have you guys even taken a look at, actually, did I put your skills packet online? No. Mm -mm. Okay. I'll do that at the break. So let me. I hate slow computers. <laughs> On the primary assessment, you do do your ABCs, correct? Run that by me again? On your primary assessment, you conduct your, your ABCs? Yes, but we're not there yet. Oh, my bad. So, like I was saying about your, your, your 331, so I'm trying to open up the skills manual on, on here so I can show you guys. But think about this as you're approaching your patient. The very first thing, so we're going to talk about the first three. The very first thing is your general impression. Now, the general impression, your book says it's 
what's the sex of the patient, what's their approximate age, that kind of stuff. To me, honestly, forgive my vulgarity, if you can't tell what sex they are, then there's something wrong. Although nowadays it's it's a little bit harder and people aren't entitled, you know, so that that's not really a big deal. Um, as far as the age, okay, you know, it's kind of a generalization. Do they have gray hair or, or not? Are they little kids behaving like little kids? So it's not the end all be all. What, what's more important is, is there anything about that patient that is bugging you? That's your general impression. Is there anything about that patient that's bugging you? The reason being is because <clears throat> I don't know how I did that, but it kind of works out pretty good. Um, because there's something there bugging you, then that should be a, a, an important thing to take care of. What what I call that that is actually let me back up a little bit so that's bugging you. do they have a piece of rebar sticking out of their chest are they missing part of their leg is there you know the accident you look at the car it's like oh that doesn't look good okay so is there anything about that call that's bugging you now that bugging you part is what I like to call the oh shit factor. In other words, when you first put eyes on that patient, did that scene make you go, oh shit? Because there are times that's gonna happen. And I know I can tell you from experience because I've found myself doing that. Let me give you two examples. The first one, and I might have talked about him before. We get a call for a person down on the freeway, man down on the freeway. We show up, and we pull up. My partner sees the patient, and he says, shit, it's a kid. So I hurry over, and I look down at him, and what do you think the first words out of my mouth were? Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Because there he is laying on the freeway with his eyes looking up, open. He's motionless. If you've ever seen the Egyptian figures or kind of, kind of, you know, walk like an Egyptian, if you've ever seen the video for that song, I know it's way before you guys' time, but um, that's what he looked like. His leg was bent. Uh, it was broken. It was almost severed off completely. There was chunks of bone on the freeway for several feet every so often, every couple feet, a piece of bone. Uh, arm was all messed up. So it was pretty bad. So I said, oh, shit. It like fell out of the car or No, he actually fell. Out of the car? No. He, uh, what I found out later, was um, I was wondering, uh, he actually fell from the overpass. And I remember, remember we talked about well-being and, and the traumatic stuff. So uh, after that call, this was overnight. So I, I remember getting home and I had a dream about that kid because I, I was thinking how what would have driven this 14 year old kid to oh, jump okay. off to kill himself, right? So, you know, I always wondered and, and I felt bad for him. And then and, um, I was teaching a class and I was actually using that example. And one of the students raised her hand and said, Hey, I remember that. I used to live up that way. And I remember that, that incident. And I said, You know what happened? And she tells me he was up there tagging the sign. And he lost his balance and he fell to his death. That's sad. Yeah. So. 
Um, so after that, but no, I, I dreamt about him one night and I always wondered, but then I let him go and whatever. So I talked to him without any problems. I don't have flashbacks. But again, looking at that, that oh shit factor. Here's another one. Um, I had a call. There was a gentleman, gangbanger, that had gone to visit some friends or family or something. And he was walking back home. And instead of going the long way around, he decides to take a shortcut through the church parking lot. Well, this is at night, so the church is closed. The, the gates are closed. Um, but he had partaken in some stuff that you guys are mentioning and partaking. Some frosty cold beverages, shall we say. And he wasn't the best at balance. So he climbs up on the fence to go over. However, because of, of his swift footedness, he slides down. He loses footing. He falls down. So we get there. He's stuck. He can't move. So we get there. And I look. And what do I see? The fence. It's a raw iron fence. And it has the spears at the top. And so I see him on top of the spears. And I look, and he has it in the fold of the skin right next to his scrotum. Okay. Ouch. Oh, it gets better. Mm. It gets better. So I'm looking, I'm like, oh, crap, we're going to have to call a truck. We're going to have to cut this iron off or iron the fence so we can take him. He's going to have to go to surgery, get it taken care of that way. And so I'm thinking that. But anyway, so when I first got out of the ambulance and I see him up there, what do you think I thought? Okay. Oh, shit. <laughs> Are you noticing a trend? Are you, yeah. have, have you that figured out? That's definitely oh, shit. Yeah, that's why I call it the oh, shit factor. Because there's things that are making me go, oh, shit. And you're going to experience the same thing. Have you had that happen to you, Rosie? Yeah, when you're like, oh, yeah, well. We have to get the oh shit bag when we go to a scene. Yeah, because it's it, it's bad. Okay. So anyway, with this kid or this guy. So what I noticed was there was balls, not his. I don't mean his balls. I mean <laughs> metal, <laughs> metal detective <laughs> balls. <laughs> I just got to clarify. On, top of his spear, on all of them. And so I look, and he didn't impel himself. So he had fallen, and that little ball was pressed uh, next to his regular ball, but um, it was just up there. It, he didn't sta get stabbed. Okay. So, okay, so we lifted him up. We got him into the gurney. Uh, I mean, he was intoxicated and everything. So uh, we get him in the back of the ambulance. Now, I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but when a gangbanger wears tidy whities I just think you lose a little bit of street cred. <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> tidy whities And I mean, these tidy whities were really white. So we're talking about briefs? Yeah, the tidy whities Oh, yeah, that's not a gangbanger. No. That's not for anybody. Like That's a halfway crook. That's what you call that. That's uh, when you're a little. That's when you're a little kid. Maybe it was laundry. Sure. All he had was tidy whities True. But these were so like freaking. Don't wear nothing at all. Don't wear basketball shorts. <laughs> don't wear basketball shorts. Don't put on no briefs. Yeah, Most go commando. Don't defend it. <laughs> the wife like it like that. <laughs> they're as they were as white as your teeth. They were white. Maybe they were brand new too. <laughs> Could be, but I can't. <laughs> When I go Jonas shopping, I don't go pick out the tidy whities. Sorry. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's sad. So, anyway, so, <laughs> and the reason I mentioned the tidy whities was because I saw a red spot on his tidy whities. It was almost a 50 cent piece. 
So, took off the ch- uh, the the chonis, the tidy whities. I don't remember if I just yanked them down. Hopefully not. I think I cut them for my manlyhood sake. I cut them. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> lo and behold, how am I going to say that I pulled down this dude's underwear? It just doesn't yeah. matter. Because so. that was about there's about to be some jokes coming out right now, Luke. Yeah. If you said so that. Uh-huh. I don't think you can come back from that of yanking yeah, his pants. <laughs> Remember my scissors, so I cut. Mm-hmm. Okay, to save my manlyhood. Mm-hmm. Fuck, it doesn't save my manlyhood because I cut them off. <laughs> I didn't yank them off. Right. It's just uh, like a uh, magic mic. No, it was, no, it was <laughs> magic. No. <laughs> like you it was magic mic. Right that there. I had that was uh, uh, altered, and I remember. Uh, well, I did take off her her skirt, and then she ended up having it one of those one piece things, Um, like a body suit. suit, But I noticed why it's important to bikini wax. But anyway, wow, yeah, good shit, not old shit. Uh, Yeah. Oh, I've seen a lot of stuff. I had a cute early twenty something female college student. I had gone home and she uh, had partied a little too hard somehow. Um, and she, all she was wearing, and when I say all she was wearing, I mean all she was wearing was a sweatshirt. And now this was in the late 90s. And so back then, I think a landing strip was okay, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's actually pretty sexy. The sweatshirt, just the sweatshirt on. That is actually really just. That was sexy. a good save, Lou. That was a good save of your manlyhood. Thank you. Nice. It doesn't cut the. Okay. What up? Oh, uh, by the way, I took the legs on that one. Remember, I showed you GS. No, I got, I got the legs on that one. I'm not gonna be behind her. Not give my part. I'm not gonna give my part of the satisfaction of the legs. <laughs> Anyway, going back, because everybody else is like, Lou, shut up, get on with the story. So anyway, so I uh, I somehow removed this gentleman's chonus. Mm-hmm. And what did I see? <clears throat> like I said, about a – actually, it was, it was a little bit bigger than a quarter. But when he fell down, he did injure himself from that spear. He came down, and he actually avulsed. A piece of his scrotum. Mm. So, sliced off a piece of his scrotum from that blade, or not blade, but spear, kind of, sort of. So, yeah, still, oh shit. Yeah. I don't think he can come back from that. No. That's what happens when you get a little intoxicated. A liquid curry, man. Uh huh. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to share this right here. So uh, somehow I uh, I color coded this stuff. So we talked about uh, the scene size up, and if you look at Penman PPE right there, by isolation BSI. Environment determines scene safety. Uh, number of patients right here determines the number of patients. Uh, mechanism range or nature of illness, it's right there. Additional resources, it's right there. And need for extrication. And this is why I say slash C spine, because right here is stabilize, stabilization of C spine. Okay. So you guys see that, that yellow? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the next part, you'll see here, the primary survey resuscitation, it, it is what it is. The primary, the primary assessment. I said 331, right? Yeah. Well, this blue, there's your first three. I talked about the general impression. How does that patient look as you're approaching them? Is there, is there anything that's making you go, oh, shit? The next part of that is so remember you're approaching did you see anything no okay you keep approaching 
So is that patient tracking you? In other words, what's their level of consciousness? Are they awake or are their eyes closed? If they're tracking you, they're awake, they're alert. Beautiful. That's what we want. If not, when we <clears throat> get to them, they're not tracking us, their eyes are closed. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to say, sir, open your eyes. Or ma'am, open your eyes. If they comply with that, cool. Then they are what we say they respond to verbal stimulus. Now, Sequoia did an answer. She wasn't tracking me as I'm approaching her. And I'm picking on her because she's on my screen. Yeah. Um, she didn't. Uh, she wasn't tracking me. Her eyes weren't open. So I get up to her and I say, ma'am, can you open your eyes for me? And she didn't respond. Is that when so, you rub the sternum? Exactly. Well, you could do the sternum. I don't or like the sternum very much. Head. I've done it. Huh? No, go ahead. Sorry. No, you first. I, I, can hear. Don't you like stimulate some pain, like pinching, like? Do painful stimulus, some sort of painful stimulus. Uh, the sternal rub is the most common, but you have to be careful because when you're when you're practicing with your buddies, you tend to get really carried away. And then you kind of forget that when you're doing it on a real person and you get carried away. But I've done it. Oh, I've done it to uh, unresponsive people at Speaking Rock. I do it a lot. Some of my residents are, uh, are responsive to me. Yeah. Just pop um, them on your stick. Popped in what? I'm sorry? Pop them pneumonia stick. They went away. They went away from those. You know why? Why? Because that was something that that people were doing to see if somebody was faking it. But they would hold them down or they would put a mask over their face to keep that in. Wow. And like be literally holding it up against the face because they thought they they were um, faking it. They were faking it. That's not good. And so somebody actually got hurt because of that. So, yeah, they stopped that. But, yeah, you could use that. But there's easier ways. Uh, sternal right. rub, like I said, is, is pretty easy. I've done it on people before, and they don't respond. Um, I've gotten so carried away. I actually had a student that went unresponsive on me in class. And so what you could do, and I can't see myself, so you have to tell me. Am I pinching my – you see me pinching my middle finger? On that nail bed? Yeah. Yeah. So right there where the skin meets the nail, you pinch down, Al. It hurts. So you could do that. Trapezius up in here, up in the shoulder. That's a painful stimulus point. Um, take a pen or a pencil, put it between the knuckles right there. Bring it down. You got to get it just right. Ow. And I keep touching myself. Uh, some people will do it up here. Be very careful. Um, also a calf squeeze. What's that? Where you squeeze the calf, oh. the calf muscle. I can't show you now. I don't want to show you my legs. <laughs> Because you'll see that I just shaved my legs yesterday, so I don't want you guys to question my manhood again. Oh, man. I know. I'm horrible. What does AVPU stand for? That's what I'm going over right now. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, that wasn't in your reading? No. In all the chapters? No. I think I've seen it. So anyway, um, the the ones you don't want to do are purple nurples and testicular twists. No purple nurple. No, Got it, Rosie. Yes, sir. I was about to say, oh. Rosie seems like she would do something like that to someone. <laughs> I'll do the other one. <laughs> You'll do both. What are you talking about? 
just don't piss me off. I... Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I could see you doing both. <laughs> I see that that halo being held up by your horns. Don't worry. Oh, man. <laughs> no comment. That's all we need to know. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so Rosie did end up doing a purple norpal, and the patient still didn't react. Then we consider the patient unresponsive. Okay. So then the patient is unresponsive. So did you see, Miss Rosie, I just went through AVPU? Alert, response to verbal stimulus, response to pain, full stimulus, or unresponsive. Exactly. AVPU, APU. Alert, response to verbal, response to painful, or unresponsive. You like how I tied it all together, Miss Rosie? Yes. All right. And then the next thing is determine chief complaint or any apparent life threats. So unless there's something really life threatening that we see that, that we got to take care of quickly, we're going to look at chief complaint. Now they were unresponsive. Can they tell me what's wrong with them? No. No. And so there's our chief complaint. They're unresponsive. Um. So again, I see Miss Sequoia right here. Actually, I'll pick on Rosie. I'm gonna change so I can see Miss Rosie who has her camera off. I see, I, I look. Although I already know a lot of people have their cameras off too, but George I know has his on, I see Paul. All right, Miss Rosie, I only see half your face, but. Oh, so, okay, what's up? So, you're my patient, and I've already determined my scene size up. I'm, I'm doing my general impression. I'm walking towards you. As I, as I start looking at you, nothing about you bugs me, okay? And so, I, I have a good general impression of you. And then you're tracking me, right? You're looking at me. So, the APU scale, what are you? Alert. Alert. Okay. So, because you're alert, I could ask you your chief complaint, right? Yes. And so, the way it works is I'm going to do it this way. Hi, ma'am. My name is Lou. I'm an EMT. What's your name? My name is Rosie. Rosie, what's going on today? Um, I have shortness of breath. Okay. So, did I just establish... Her chief complaint. Yeah. Yes, yes, I did. And so now, guess what? I also started with the next part, but we'll we'll say that for after break. But um, as far as let me get my mouse back. So as as. As far as the first three, verbalizes your impression, determines the responsiveness of APU, and determines chief complaint and prior life threats, I just finished that. I just did my first three. So now it's going to be time for the next three. And that's what you were saying earlier about your ABCs. A, B, C. How many is that? A, B, C. Three. And the next thing we're talking about is three. So mm -hmm. is it Coincidence? No. I think not. There's a reason for it. Okay. Uh, so I'll come back to that after after break. Um, I have 10, 11. Uh, how about be back at 10, 30? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll see you then. <laughs> 